What's flourishing, Mr. Abort? Shit. God damn it. I'm sorry. I said Sophie. to do better than the first oh, part. Oh, boy. That was, I don't even know. Flourishin? I don't even know what I was, I just was trying to rhyme something with abortion. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore, Sophie. What do, what do we, what do we, what are we all here for? We're here What's, for uh, part two of your podcast, uh, Behind the that Bastards. That doesn't seem right. You're the host. Your name is Robert Evans. Uh, and your guest today is the magnificent, wonderful, fantastic, incredibly talented Teresa Lee. Teresa, Hello. what would you rhyme? What would you rhyme with abortion? L- let me see. Uh, open the doorshin. It's time for a portion of abortion. Oh, that see, actually see what I said. Talented. That, that, uh, it was so much better. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, we're still talking about Phyllis Schlafly, who was not a fan of abortion and would not have enjoyed our our our, our having yucks about the name abortion. Um, not the concept, <laughs> just the word and trying to mm. rhyme it with things. You have to use a lot of contortions to rhyme with abort. As a fan of poetry and fucking on yeah. books, I would think she would love rhymes, but um, I guess you have to listen to the first episode to know that callback. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about <laughs> Goldwater and Rockefeller going against each other in the 64 Republican primaries, right? And how, like, this is a battle for the soul of the Republican Party because LBJ is obviously going to win the election. Um, Phyllis could see that, like, something was so that basically— That was so nice of you, Robert, to say that there was a soul. <laughs> yeah, everything has a—Hitler had a soul, Sophie. Um, oh, he definitely had a soul, if you'd seen him dance, you'd know that. Oh, gosh. Oh, God. <laughs> what a strange so, image. That from my mental space. For, stood some, up for, for some reason, I pictured him break there. dancing, was, and it was enjoyable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's the only kind of dancing Hitler got up to. It was just like he actually invented break dancing. Like oh he, he, actually, he had a couple of years on the streets in Harlem teaching. I don't know what where I'm going with any of this. I feel so, like if he danced more, he would have been happier from the start. I, I, I don't feel like most hateful people are not dancing as much. I, I do think that dancing is broadly good for you. But I also think that hateful people get really into like hateful dances, like where everybody's like all tense and like right up against oh, each true, other. True. Um, like although punk, Hitler like did. The, like sort yeah. of skinhead punky music scene. No, no, no. Like the fucking like the like gone with the wind dances, like the kind of dances mm. rich old mm. southern people Slow did. Slow walking to cello music. Yeah. Yeah, and just for the record, Hitler actually hated dancing and refused to dance because it made him, <laughs> he, he felt awkward about his body. So you're right about that. I was just being an <laughs> asshole for no reason. Let's talk about Goldwater. Speaking of Hitler, let's talk about oh, Barry God. Goldwater. Um, so Goldwater and Rockefeller's primary battle was like neck and neck right up to the California primaries. And that was kind of the thing that was going to determine who won this battle. Um, and so this is kind of where Phyllis Schlafly uh, comes in with a groundbreaking piece of propaganda. She writes a book called A Choice, Not an Echo. And this was like a pro-Goldwater argument. But more than that, it was it was essentially a conspiracy theory about how the Republican primary was being stolen by kingmakers <laughs> within the party who were Eastern elites. Um, yes. And that, yeah... Yeah, this is you know you know how like in 2016 like the Trump supporters talk about Republicans in name only the rhinos, right? Mm-hmm. How like you've got this the real party who supports Trump, and then you've got these Republicans in name only who are trying to force their own like corporatist candidates on us. This is the first <laughs> time anyone starts talking about that. Phyllis Schlafly starts that arg- that line of like propaganda back in 1964. The idea that there's these Eastern elites in the party that are fighting against the real Republican Party. Whenever someone comes up with a conspiracy theory, it, they're usually the like the ones doing the conspiring. Like it sounds like these are because it's like the idea that anybody wants to win. That's not a conspiracy. Like, yeah, it's, a, it's an election. People want to win. That's people made that clear. But then when you're secretly adding weird facts that aren't true, that's a conspiracy. And you're doing that, Phyllis. Yeah, and it's it, well, I mean, yeah, because she's literally a part of this conspiracy to o- to to, 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 yeah, to take over the Republican the Party and the government. Yeah, so she writes this book about how Goldwater is not just a great candidate, but that there's this like conspiracy within the Republican Party to stop him from becoming the candidate. Um, mm-hmm. And it 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 is extremely successful. A, a choice, not an echo, sells nearly three million copies and went on to hugely influence the California primary and the election. Um, it delivered. It's generally seen as being a big 
big part of what delivered Goldwater a surprise victory over Rockefeller. And Phyllis, for the rest of her life, will brag that she self-publishes this book out of her garage and that it just becomes this massive hit that she she just does all by her little old self. Um, and she was adamant that her whole operation was just the result of one mother who cared, um, you know, writing as a side project while she raised her kids. Because again, this whole period, well, she is a full-time hard-nosed political operative. She has to lie mm. to everybody on her side and claim that like it's just sort of a thing she does after tucking the kids in at night because you can't have a woman actually have her career be the center of her life which it is for phyllis but she has to lie about it she's like a a, the first el james isn't she the woman who wrote um 50 shades of gray out of her like girl i mean not garage out of her room or whatever self-published yeah except for I think E.L. James actually did self-publish her terrible book. Um, (laughs) And Phyllis Schlafly's lying about self-publishing her book. So uh, Mm -hmm. as she later told the New York Times, quote, 1964 was the most productive year of my life. I was running the Illinois Federation of Republican Women. I wrote A Choice, Not an Echo. I self-published it. I went to the Republican convention, wrote a second book, The Grave Diggers. Now we're in September. I was giving speeches for Barry Goldwater. And in November, I had a baby. So she like this is how she frames her year. Um, And... She's she's sort of, again, this weird kind of thing in Phyllis where she's clearly very proud about how much she does. But she also has to emphasize, as she does in a little bit here, like how she was this was all sort of secondary to her job as a uh, as a as a mother. Like she wasn't she wasn't a mother with a career or she Mm. wasn't like a she didn't she doesn't want to be seen as a working mom because she thinks that's evil, even though that's exactly what she is. That's what she is. Um, I'm going to quote now from a town and country magazine write up that summarizes kind of like how Phyllis frames her career during this period. Even as she was traveling across the country to lobby leaders, organize her coalition, give speeches, and at one point simultaneously pursue a law degree, Schlafly dismissed her political career as a hobby, a secondary pursuit to her obligations at home with her six children. I was never gone overnight, she later told the Times, reiterating that line of defense. I'd drive out to give a speech, and sometimes I'd bring a nursing baby with me. There was always someone outside willing to take care of a baby rather than listen to a long lecture so this was a savvy way for Mm. Schlafly to frame her activism like the moral conservatives that she was courting would didn't like the idea of women usurping traditional male role models but they did like the idea of like a young mother self-publishing a political treatise about conservatism and how good it was for moms you know to to be women to be homemakers instead of have careers they liked that idea of her like doing that in between breastfeedings um and like that she was able to that sounds like a bad like her saying that she gave her baby to someone standing outside that's, that's like what happens at auditions when you see like people um bring their baby which is fine because it's like you got to go in for like 10 minutes or whatever but i'm like that you're yeah. describing exactly what being a working mother is like like if you if you really weren't then you'd just be at home <laughs> So she's advocating that women shouldn't do this while doing it. And she has to kind of lie about the extent to which she she has to frame it as like a hobby, even though like, no, Phyllis, this was your full time fucking job. Like you had a full time job and kids and that's fine. But you hate that for everyone else because you're a giant hypocrite. But. So the only kind of way to sell this to Republicans without her being sort of suspect and a liberated woman is to kind of make it look like she was just kind of this homespun mom who's writing this book, wrote, write this book on her free time. And, you know, oh, surprisingly, it sells huge. And she does it all out of her garage. And it's kind of evidence of how, like, the little guy, these, like, little conservatives, we don't need the big corrupt publishing industry. And, of course, again, this is all a lie. The reality of the situation is that the John Birch Society bought, like, three million copies of this book to distribute it for free and they handled the publication the the publishing house that phyllis uh-huh. schlafly claims she created to publish it out it was just a front company like there were real publishers that the john birch society went to and contracted with they would sometimes order five hundred thousand copies at a time of wow. this book so it's propaganda right because it's distributed for free yes. it's not yes best-selling. <laughs> yes it was number one all of the sales pretty much came from the John Birch Society buying them to hand these out for free. Sounds like a communism handout yeah, for free. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, giving money to then give it to other people for free. Hmm. Sounds yeah. like communism. She has to frame this as like <laughs> I was just this 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 plucky little outsider like in my free time putting together this book about the things <laughs> I believed and so many other people believe it that it took off. And the reality is like no no no, you were part of a multi she was part she was the head of a multi-million dollar propaganda campaign by the John Birch Society. Um, and they're the reason this book sold three million copies because they bought like three million copies. This is what Hillsdale does. Yeah, it's what they all do. 
They literally send out so many fundraising emails. I signed up like with a fake email to get them. And then they send you free newsletters for the rest of your life. I mean, I didn't get the newsletters, but the whole idea is that if you donate, we'll give out free newsletters to everyone. So you're basically paying for propaganda, which is communism. Yeah. It's just within their own ranks of communism. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 very silly. Um, I mean, it's not silly. It's like this horrible, dangerous um, propaganda network that's just getting started at this point. So this is like the birth of that ma- this massive right wing propaganda. Like it, the the thing that like mm-hmm. Ben Shapiro and the fucking Turning Point mm-hmm. USA kids and like all of oh, these God. different so like Breitbart News, all these yeah. different kind of like right wing news and media organizations uh, are part of today. Um, this massive like dark funding network of right wing propaganda is getting off the ground now. And Phyllis Schlafly is like its first big success. Mm-hmm. Now, these books, obviously, again, were not being bought by curious readers. Like, they were being bought in mass to be handed out. Um, and she was, you know, Schlafly's book was just kind of the most successful part of this wave of hard right propaganda that starts being distributed by the John Birch Society at this point. Some of it attacked LBJ. There were other books that obsessed over communist infiltration. But Schlafly's work would go on to have the longest influence uh, because Goldwater secured the nomination. At the party's national convention in July near San Francisco, Goldwater delegates booed Nelson Rockefeller so loudly that he could barely give his concession speech. The same delegates who'd screamed moments earlier cheered when Goldwater gave his speech, which included the famous declaration that extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. This is like Goldwater's speech at the 1964 San Francisco convention is like a straight up fascist rally. Um, And one of the reporters who's actually there to hear it live was a young Hunter S. Thompson. And he wrote my favorite description Mm. of this. I remember feeling genuinely frightened at the violent reaction to that line that Goldwater said. As the human thunder kept building, they mounted their metal chairs and began howling, shaking their fists at Huntley and Brinkley up in the NBC booth. And finally, they began picking up those chairs with both hands and bashing them against chairs other delegates were still standing on. It's this, like unhinged hatred of the media um hatred of you know mm-hmm. the party elites this like the 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 thing that's been at the core of the Republican party ever since that like Trump kind of let loose again that the respectable people in the party have always tried to keep locked up it starts to break out for the first time under Goldwater and of course Goldwater was electorally doomed there were not enough people who believed this uh-huh. and who were willing to admit to being this kind of person in 1964 uh LBJ actually delivered what's probably the greatest pantsing in the his- history of national politics like I don't, no one since has ever lost as badly as goldwater lost um like it is he they he is torn apart in this election um and the republican party just is 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 beaten into the ground at least mm. that's how it looks from the outside the reality is that this kind of had more to do with lbj's strength than a weakness in goldwater strategy and i think that becomes clear like later on but at the mm-hmm. time people like assume Oh, this is uh, there's a lot of assumptions on the left that like, oh, like the frothing anti-communist wing of the of the Republican Party lost like this will they're going to turn to more reasonable politics now. And that's not what happens as Politico or as a write up I found in Politico notes, quote, from Goldwater's insurgency onward, the die was cast and the GOP has never returned to a moderate platform. Goldwater's base was in the south and west where his vote against the Civil Rights Act and in favor of states rights endeared him to a white electorate. And on the whole, Goldwater's geographic Demographic and demographic coalition has endured within the GOP. Democrats owe a debt of gratitude to Goldwater for creating a near consensus among African Americans for their party. Until 1964, presidential par- nominees from the party of Lincoln would often receive up to a third of the black vote. Goldwater dipped to an estimated 4% of black supporters. And in the 50 years since, the most a GOP nominee could hope for was about 10% of African American votes. Hmm. So that's that's where this all starts with Goldwater. He builds like he launches the GOP, his candidacy does on the path that it's still on today and on the electoral path that it's still on today. And a number of Republican voices at the time thought that Goldwater's defeat was proof that Nixon and Rockefeller had been right to try to open the party up. But Phyllis Schlafly was not convinced of this. And neither were a whole lot of other anti-communist Christian extremists who felt the increasingly liberal culture of the United States was stealing their children and country from them. The Goldwater campaign was the 
activation point for a lot of folks who'd become major figures in what people eventually called the new right. Paul Weyrich worked on the campaign, along with Howard Phillips and Richard Vigory, three of the men who later joined with Jerry Falwell to start the moral majority. Mm. Falwell and his crew get a lot of credit for birthing the religious right and launching the culture war that's currently, you know, mm-hmm. uh, our entire lives. Uh, and and it's true that they were like kind of the the faces of this and the people who, you know, created the term moral majority, but they were really just cripping from Phyllis Schlafly's moral <laughs> conservatives in 1960, which was the first organized gasp of this sort of thing. Now, after Goldwater's defeat, men like Weyrich and Falwell at kind of like the 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 face men of the of the new Republican Party uh, tended to ignore Phyllis Schlafly. They saw her as a a once useful propaganda tool that was like consigned to the past now. And for a while, Schlafly herself seemed to even believe this. And as the story goes, it was her husband, Fred, who first suggested what would become her next crusade after Goldwater's failure, stopping the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, now, gosh. if you happen to be a reasonable person and not like a screeching demon, the ERA is pretty <laughs> much the, the least offensive <laughs> amendment you can imagine. It just states, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any by any state on account of sex, right? Mm-hmm. Hard to... Hard to argue with that. <laughs> and nobody seemed to want to argue it when it was first proposed in March of 1972. Uh, it was very broadly popular. A lot of Republicans liked it. Uh, it was it was just kind of like, oh, we're saying this. like, And it was seen as kind of more of like a symbolic vote. It's like, oh, we should announce openly that like we as yeah. the United States don't like gender discrimination. That's all that was going on <laughs> with the ERA. Now, because it was an amendment, though, it needed to be approved by both the House and the Senate, which it was in March of 1972. So very bipartisan, gets through the mm-hmm. House and Senate. And then it need, needed to be sent to the states for ratification. 38 states would have had to ratify the ERA for it to become law. And this seemed easy to do at first. 30 state legislator, uh, legislatures ratified the ERA during 1972 alone. So they get almost to the finish line in the first Mm -hmm. year that this thing's on the voting docket. Uh, Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Carter all supported it. Uh, It should have been like a moment of bipartisan (laughs) achievement. But Phyllis Schlafly decided to declare war on the Equal Rights Amendment. And I'm going to quote now from a write-up on her in Town & Country magazine. Quote, When she first heard that the Equal Rights Amendment was being debated in Congress, she told her biographer, Carol Fezenthal, Shafley thought of it as something between innocuous and mildly helpful. But after a friend asked her to debate a feminist on the ERA at the end of 1971, she changed her mind. In October of 1972, she founded Stop ERA, an acronym for, and this is a terrible acronym, (laughs) Stop Taking Our Privileges. Uh, Wait, stop ERA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the word stop is in the acronym. It's terrible. Oh, no. The acronym, which is stop. I hate it. The the whole thing is like, I mean, there's so many layers. Like, the fact that she's debating a feminist and there's two women debating like that by itself is pretty feminist. And then also just like her... um, like, I don't know. I've, it's, I'm also sensing, I think it's, I'm getting a different read because I heard of our trauma talk in that last episode that I'm feeling like she's still evil, but I also sense she's doing this out of survival. Like when she was getting kicked out of this, the, you know, like losing relevancy, she was like, well, they'll need a woman at the front of this because a man can't say this because it's more weaponized if a woman is anti-feminist. Yet she's hurting herself because if she just got on board, she could just have everything with feminism. I don't know. Which is very similar to the character Robert was talking about in Handmaid's Tale, actually, with what you just said. Mm-hmm. Well, what, even what Robert said about the bipartisanship of ERA mm-hmm. reminds me so much of coronavirus. Like when it came out, it's like, this is not a partisan issue. We're all just going to handle this like people who want to live. And then all of a sudden it was like, eh, 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 DJ Scratch. Now it's partisan. You're like, What? Since yeah. when did living become partisan? <sighs> yeah, Anyways, so... Too sad. It's a bummer. She becomes the chairwoman of Stop ERA, uh, and she taps into this network of women. She's like... So it, like in creating this... Um, like she has this network of women she's built. So she like first off she distributed this book to a bunch of people that like get, that like builds her a fan base and she started a newsletter after that, which is kind of the way as a conservative at this point that you like you build a political um coalition mm. because all these you get all these hundreds of thousands of people in your newsletter and then you can you can get them to buy books, you can get them to vote on like you can get them 
you can organize them as like a donate. Mainly, you can get them to donate money. Um, mm-hmm. So like this is kind of how she starts this coalition, and she she founds a group. First, she found Stop ERA, and then she fi- founds a group called the Eagle Forum, um, which is like this right wing think tank or this right wing like advocacy organization um, that is formed around Phyllis Schlafly, basically coaching stay at home moms to become activists <laughs> to stop the ERA. So she's trying to organize all of these like conservative religious housewives. Um, into a political coalition. Uh, she described her recruits uh, in the Atlantic as, quote, housewives who didn't even know where their state capital was. Uh, and Schlafly instructed them in everything from how to speak to the press and run phone banks to how to dress and smile for the camera. Um, in 1973, uh, the Supreme Court ruled on Roe versus Wade, which made uh, reproductive health care safer for a lot of Americans and also gave all of these, like, gave Phyllis Schlafly uh, basically a dose of fucking rocket fuel because now the religious right mm. starts getting, like, really, like, th- th- she, so there's, there's a lot going on here at once, which is that <laughs> you have this Equal Rights Amendment, which doesn't start out as being controversial, but Schlafly is able to convince a bunch of, um, like, Christian housewives, this is going to um, this is going to destroy like the traditional family and take your privileges. Uh, and at the same time, like abortion becomes legal, so she weaves it into like that. The, this ERA is part of this like push, um, and like it's going to make you know abortion uh, more common too. And so like she kind of she kind of keeps grabbing these different sca- things that are to religious conservatives scary about the 1970s um, and weaving them all together into this like one gigantic um, uh, fight. Um, mm. And it, it, it's this thing where like she kind of backsides the the traditional Republican Party at this point. So like in 1977, Gerald Ford's wife backs the ERA at the National Women's Conference. Um, and the National Women's Conference of 1977, like one of the conference's goals was taxpayer funded daycare for all children, which Gerald Ford's wife, like the president's wife, is a big supporter <laughs> of. So like the tradi- like the Republican party structure is like willing to talk about these things that mm-hmm. like are 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 kind are very socialist policies at this point and Schlafly's the person who like calls that straight up communism and she starts she organizes these all these hundreds of thousands of like conservative homemakers to to make this their war to make like stopping any uh, any of this stuff, like the 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 crusade that they that they embark upon, um, we talked in the Fallwell episodes about how like once upon a time abortion was a non issue for American evangelicals. Like a lot of American right wingers and evangelicals used to be pro abortion back in like the the seven the sixties and early seventies. And Schlafly mm-hmm. gets a lot of credit for making it into a political like culture war issue. And that's kind of like what she's doing in this period. She's taking all of these things that were kind of bipartisan that are now even today, like the idea of like, oh, we should have a national daycare program. That used to not be a partisan issue. A lot of conservatives Mm -hmm. used to support that issue. Schlafly turns it into like, if you support that, you support communism. (laughs) Abortion used to not be a big political issue. Schlafly starts organizing and and propagandizing to make it into one. She's just creating culture wars. That's Phyllis Schlafly in the 1970s. She's she's helping to be the midwife to all of these culture wars huh. that are still with us today. Well, she's kind of pushing people into this corner. Yeah, we hadn't been divided about this stuff. Yeah, you're right. There, she's pushing people into this corner to where like you can't debate about this. You can't come to an agreement about this. Yeah. You can't meet each other in the middle. This is something that we fight over forever now. Right, because there's people who, um, for religious re- reasons, will always be on one side, and she yeah. forces that an entire party to only represent that side, and then forcing the other party to take the other side, which means that if you fall anywhere in the middle on any other issues, but that's the one thing you won't budge on, you have to join that party, whether or not economically or anything else, uh, makes sense for you. Yes. And also, yeah. she convinces and her propaganda pushes a lot of uh – pushes a lot of people to who pushes a lot of religious conservatives who hadn't been against abortion to consider that like a key issue mm-hmm. for them. Like, again, there'd been a, a lot of like a decent amount of like evangelicals who had been OK 
with with at least some abortions prior to this. And she shuts that shit down. She's a huge part of this becoming a black and white, no compromise. We're just going to fight mm. about this till the heat death of the universe issue. And that's her goal is to make as many of those issues as possible because they create a durable coalition. You can't have mm. coalition switch like they did with the Republican and Democratic Party. They switched in like the early around like civil rights and stuff. You cannot have your coalition switch. You can't people will not leave your coalition if you convince them that the only thing on the other side is the devil. And like that's mm-hmm. Phyllis Schlafly's goal is to create culture wars that cannot be resolved because it means that the Republican Party has a durable electorate to um to represent it. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I want to quote, there's a, a woman named Tanya Melek, um, and, and Melek is generally considered to be one of the founders of, like, the modern women's political movement. She was one of the first, like, women in, uh, like, mainstream American politics in a big way. She helped organize a bunch of, like, uh, different kind of grassroots things. She, and she was, she was a conservative activist for most of her career who kind of turned around uh, at a later date and came to regret some of what she'd done. And she was a contemporary of Phyllis's, and she watched all of this happen. And so she kind of, she's a good, she's a good person to go to for like a description of like what Phyllis Schlafly is building during this period of the early 1970s. Mm. Quote, it was Schlafly with her authoritarian leadership and expert grassroots organizing who made the religious right a political player. It was Schlafly, first of the Goldwater and then of the new right team, who unearthed the political gold of misogyny. It was Schlafly who translated fear of women's liberation into a political force in the Republican Party and thereby extended the foundation of the Republican Southern strategy. Now, not only did the strategy flourish on the backlash of the civil rights movement, but it was broadened to include a backlash against the women's movement, too. Mellet claims that Schlafly's tactics were consciously modeled on the moral panic and the fear-mongering that right-wingers had tried to ignite during the battle over desegregation. Um, A number of the evangelical leaders who made up the moral majority had wound up in expensive battles with the IRS over whether or not they had to desegregate their whites-only religious schools. We talk about this in the Jerry Falwell episodes. Mm -hmm. And that's what Falwell and Weyrich had launched the moral majority to fight against, school integration. And they'd had some success in like getting a dedicated base of evangelical extremists together, but segregation was actually really unpopular. So this the, the their initial plan for the moral majority doesn't work out. And by the early 1970s, it becomes clear to them to fall well into Weyrich that they were backing the wrong horse, and they start looking for new ideas as part of their plan to build a new political coalition that, in Weyrich's words, would be defined by us conservatives in moral terms, packaged in non-religious language, and propagated throughout the country by our new coalition. So he's trying to basically take religious conservatism, package it in non-religious language, and and push it on mm. the entire country. And he's looking for a way to do that. Um, and he realizes that while he and um, Falwell have been fucking around with anti-segregation, Phyllis Schlafly has figured out how to build this coalition on her own in the stop ERA fight. Like she's, she's put together the thing that Falwell wanted to make in the first place. And so like, while Falwell is the guy and, and Weyrich get like the credit for starting the moral majority, Phyllis is the one who make figures out how to make it work as an electoral co- coalition. She, she figures out how to actually find people for this shit. Um, and she does it in a variety of ways, not just by stoking, like she stokes fears about how, you know, the, the, the ERA is going to like change the, the nature of relationships between women and men and destroy housewives. <laughs> she also brings up fears about gay people. She starts to claim that, claim that since religious schools had been forced to desegregate, the ERA would mean forced gay marriage. So she's, again... Forced gay marriage? She's the first person in an <sighs> organized way to try to build a coalition around the fear that religious like churches will be forced to marry gay people if gay people get civil rights. Like That's, that's Phyllis oh. Schlafly's invention, too. That shit was with us in the early 2000s. Like, I grew up in that shit. I've heard of partial birth abortion was a term coined by the this group. Was she part of that? I'm sure she had a role in it. I don't know about that specifically. Like, but they'll yeah. re- reframe things that sound so much more. Like, force any marriage. Force marriage yeah. by itself sounds bad, you know? Like, yeah. But, like, then you're adding all these fears that people have. Like, forced by itself sounds bad. Forced anything. Forced lunch. I'm like, I don't yeah, want but lunch. It, it's interesting. <laughs> and, like, normally when people talk about forced marriage, they're talking about, like, people being forced into marriages. She's talking about that She's Christians about churches, will be forced to recognize gay marriages. Um, Robert, you so know there's what? Another... won't force you into <laughs> marriage. Oh, full. 
I don't know. Oh no, no. The, our our products and services pick uh uh a an, a romantic partner for life for every single one of our listeners. Oh great. My dad will be thrilled for me. Yeah, if you refuse, um, then they will they will destroy you because this is this is the totalitarianism um that that I want to <laughs> support with this podcast is is forced marriages for everybody. Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh grab whatever partner has been picked by a machine for you and listen to these other ads. So yeah, we're back. So Schlafly is the first person in like a really organized way to kind of to 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 start propagandizing over the fear of like f- that churches are going to be forced to conduct gay marriages like mm-hmm. she brings that into the public like, these are all things that are still with us she's also the one of the first pre- people and the first person i think in like an organized way to raise an alarm about unisex bathrooms uh and how like and this idea like she starts trying to freak con- conservatives out with this idea that like men are going to be using women's rooms and women are going to be using men's rooms and like think of what that'll do to your kids like again the shit that's with us today in 2020 schlafly is the person who ignites this fucking culture war consciously i have a dumb theory that because it's a lot of these rich rich out of touch people that um because every most bathrooms in pretty middle class homes are unisex but i feel like because she grew up in a mansion it's like maybe she just doesn't like sharing bathrooms at all like maybe her whole thing is like i cannot believe that someone else a person another person man or woman will be in my bathroom because it's like yeah i don't the, most <laughs> yeah. the family bathrooms are unisex like i've never been in a home actually i've never been in a home that separates men and women's bathrooms. yes but you know you know all of your family members and clearly we're all at more threat from like random strangers even though uh, usually when people are sexually assaulted yeah it's it's dumb um she, she again all she does in the 1970s and like early 80s she's just starting culture wars left and right she's a fucking culture arsonist so she gets everybody like freaking out about bathrooms and women using men's rooms and men using women's rooms yes. and uh she also gets uh fo- people lathered up over the possibility that the era would lead to women getting sent into combat so this is like one of her like propaganda lines is that like if we pass the equal rights amendment women will be draftable and then suddenly you'll have women fighting in battle and thankfully like Hmm. most of the culture wars that she started we're still fighting today you'll still you'll hear bits about this here and there but like for the most part nobody whines about this one anymore because i guess we've all gotten okay with women getting shot to death yeah i was gonna say that that one's one i would say sometimes you get lost in the binary of these arguments because if I were to break down her emotions and just look at facts, I'm like, oh, in a real debate, that's actually a valid point to bring up. We can explore because that could be a real fear. And if we're moving towards a place where women and men are, you know, considered equal, which they should be, and you're afraid to get drafted, well, then that there is something to explore there. But really, the problem is maybe more with a draft in general of, you know, it's not really this idea that men and women are equal. It's this idea that you're afraid of the draft and you thought you were safe. So maybe you don't like the draft. Yeah, it's it's she she's finding as many ways as possible. Like she again, she's building a coalition. And yeah. so like it's this mix of like stoking fear and stoking anger. Um, and, and Schlafly's work, what makes it so groundbreaking is that she found a way to get a whole shitload of white ladies to fight actively <laughs> against their own interests and in political rights. Yeah, damn. Rather than like, the, you know, this was an amendment that would have given them legal equality. And she convinced them <laughs> that instead it was going to take away their right to be supported and protected by men. She even created a political <laughs> lobbying group like the Eagle Forum. She described as the alternative to women's lib. And she told her followers, I think the main goal of the feminist movement was the status degradation of the full-time homemaker. So she take, what's actually going mm. on here is that people are trying to guarantee and enshrine in law the equality of women. And she convinces them, no, no, no. If you're a homemaker and a wife, these people hate you and they're trying to destroy your ability, like your <laughs> existence. That's what's happening here. They want to take this away from you. They want to take your family from you. That's the argument she's able to convince these people of. Because she's, she's not afraid of shit. She is doing all of this because she she's an anti-communist like extremist uh-huh. and wants the Republican Party to be in power so that it can 
build all of the nukes in the world. And she recognizes that the best way to get and keep power in the party <laughs> is to unite all these people. And that's why she's doing all this propagandizing. More than anything, she wants to to unite the because like her whole life is um is an argument against everything that she actually rallies for, right? Like she's an extremely liberated woman. Well, that's why I felt like she's trying to she's actually mm-hmm. trying to keep people down. I agree with her wanting power and uniting people, but it's like a false flag. It feels like she wants to keep like take power away from the people who have to follow her because if any of them yes. if any of these women actually get powerful, then they may they may change their mind or like, you know, fight against her or take her place. And I think she wants to keep them down while making them feel protected. Yeah, and and gathering and like that's the thing that she's able to do that's so impressive is like so she's both convinces these women that like feminists and whatnot are coming to take their ability <laughs> their right to be protected by their oh husband God. and she's able to like garner the support of religious you know men by appealing to their sense of Christian chivalry. Um, mm-hmm. Schlafly's Eagle Forum sent out letters to legislators which complained that women lawyers, women legislators, and women executives, feminists were all trying to oppress simple homemakers and housewives. And the letter ended with the note, we the wives and working women need you, dear senators and representatives, to protect us. So she's she's both able to kind of like find and like pull on this fear that these conservative homemakers have, these women have over like their place being usurped um, and mm-hmm. kind of the, you know, the, the, the history moving beyond them. And she's able to uh, like tug at the sense in these like very conservative men that like you need to protect these women from this this evil feminist conspiracy. Uh, it's one of the most brilliant pieces of political maneuvering in history. Schlafly, acting more or less on her own intuition, is responsible for building much of what became the religious right with her bare hands. Like mm-hmm. all of these groups, this hadn't been a coalition before, and she's one of the. She's one of the ground level workers who's kind of putting it together. Um, Ilsa Hogue, who's the former president of NARAL, which is like our, our big mm. uh, pro choice organization in the United States, and a lifelong opponent of Schlafly, wrote a book called The Lie That Minds that includes really trenchant analysis of the voting bloc that Phyllis helped to create. Hmm was kind of like the key figure in creating. Quote, The women involved were overwhelmingly white, church-going, and from the rural and suburban middle and upper class. By definition, they had privileges to lose, benefiting by association with the white male Christian power structure. These women quickly embraced Schlafly's core message that the push for equality would erase legal differences between men and women. They even bought her more tenuous message that the ERA would lead to supposed horrors like homosexual marriage, unisex bathrooms, or women in combat. Soon she had activated a grassroots army to zealously fight to maintain their privilege at the expense of other women's political, social, and economic equity. They cast these other women, often unmarried, single moms, gay women, and women of color, as deserving of shame because of their life choices. That all sounds familiar. Sadly. Because it's where we are today. We never move on from Phyllis Schlafly. Where can I sign up? I want to join this party. Sounds fun. Belatedly, Weyrich and Falwell of the Moral Majority realize that like Phyllis has done what they were trying and kind of like failing to do. Mm. Uh, And they quickly moved to rebrand the religious right and do it in the image of the coalition that Phyllis had built. Uh, Ilsa Hogue continues in her book, quote, they didn't dwell on the differences between her public facing messages about gender equality and their own still centered on religious freedom and school segregation. They saw the harmony in their ideology and narratives. Both factions, after all, were warning their audiences that the new buzzwords of equality, whether they were applied to black people, gay people or women, were tantamount to attacking your family, your way of life, your privileged status. The movement architects had a clear target for this message. They had no viable path to gain political dominance with zero support from women. Given the racist underpinnings of the movement, that meant they needed a good portion of white women. Evangelical white women were already primed, since many of them had been involved in the fight against desegregation. White women had always been critical in driving a lot of the -the behind-the-scenes organizing of the white supremacist movement. A political platform of family autonomy and parental rights, a kind of white supremacist maternalism, is how Elizabeth Gillespie McRae described this grassroots movement in her book, Mothers of Massive Resistance, White Women and the Politics of White Supremacy. And that's an important term, white supremacist maternalism, which is like, it's 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 Karenism, right? It's like, <laughs> it's it's white suburban moms and their hatred of everything that isn't white suburban, their hatred and fear of everything that isn't white suburban moms. That's white supremacist maternalism. That is what Phyllis Schlafly welds into an electoral coalition that she makes the core of the Republican Party. And to this day, that's who, that's who fucking 
wins like that that's a, a major factor in their ability to win elections um is white yeah, wow. white middle class ladies it, it's this idea of motherhood but you're attaching it to this very specific almost like kind of folky old, old school memory of childhood like and they all similarly they, a lot of them grew up similarly so they can just kind of use some buzzwords to like kind of trigger that nostalgia yeah and it's a lot of you it know, is like, like also yeah. Co opting the fear a lot of these these mothers have yeah. over like what's going to happen, like the world their kids are growing up in because yeah. they don't understand it and making that fear law. So you get, you know, in the 1980s, yeah. Schlafly and this this white supremacist maternalist coalition are a big part of what launches Reagan into the White House. And obviously, like one of the things Reagan does is put his wife, Nancy, um, up to like be the one of the faces of the war on drugs and just say no. And that's like. Mm. That's the that that is white supremacist maternalism in a nutshell yeah. is on the surface. You have all of these you have these like white moms scared about their kids and just wanting to protect their children. And like, that's what we're doing. We're we're strong moms who want to protect our kids. And what actually huh. happens is you have this right wing government put a carceral state into place that arrests hundreds of thousands of black and Hispanic people. Um, and yeah. then monetizes their bodies uh through forced labor and like that's what happens in the background of this where you've got this but it but a big part of why they're able to sell it is this like mm. we have to protect the children sort of thing like phyllis schlafly that's what they're doing with QAnon now they're the pedophile ring i mean it's, it's this always idea, about protecting the kids and it's always about white kids because it's i mean like i, I yes it's like this idea that white children are so innocent but then a black teen is dangerous and you're like wait a minute there, you're not really using motherhood in the right way if you're really about protecting people. But I think they're stoking this idea because they want to keep Americans or the white Americans in a constant uh, state of almost like adolescence. Like because yeah. even though they say they don't want a welfare state, if you feel like you're a child and you need protection from your mom, you are going to rely on your government and listen to them as if they're your parents. You're not going to think for yourself. And I think they this like is a part of this power struggle is like creating this parental dynamic between the government and its constituents. And it's stoked by this maternal sort of like imagery. Yeah. That's, a, I, that's a lot of what's going on here. And I, I'm going to continue quoting from Ilza Hogue. Cause I, I think what she says about Schlafly and what she does is, is really uh -huh. interesting here. Quote, Schlafly deftly steered these white women towards more public acceptance and folded them into the effort to fight gender parity measures. She never asked them to check their racism at the door. If anything, she told adherents who balked at the racist tendencies of their fellow warriors to swallow their displeasure for the sake of the cause. For her, these issues were two sides of the same coin. As stop ER and the Eagle Forum cemented themselves as the new rights ladies auxiliary, they found a sphere where they could raise their voices and flex some power without threatening the men in their lives. They used their collective weight to throw women's issues to whitewash the racist underbelly of the movement and shore up traditional power systems. Stop ERA was extremely brand conscious. They knew their value was in the perfect combination of fierce advocacy wrapped in unapologetic traditional femininity. They were known for baking pies and breads to hand out to lawmakers with the slogan, from the bread makers to the bread winners. They shamelessly flattered male lawmakers as a core part of the lobbying strategy. So this is a, this is like gut wrenching and horrible, but it's also brilliant. Like Schlafly is an mm. incredibly intelligent and effective political operator. Yeah. Um, she was a That's master of marketing. using identity politics. Yeah, From she's incredible. I mean, I like that. Like, I it makes yeah. me annoyed that they took this idea of mm. nurturing and make, gave it to the right because I'm like, I'm very much a diehard leftist. Like, I'm very radical in existence, but I'm like, I like to nurture. I like to bake pies. Yeah. Now I now yeah. you guys took that and made it an extreme conservative thing. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's this is really what keeps the Republican Party what brings it back to life, right? Mm -hmm. After like and this is what brings Ronald Reagan into office. And again, once you've got Reagan, you've got because because Reagan was like one of the big guys who rose in defense of Barry Goldwater. So like Nixon with Nixon, kind of this this sort of corporatist and and, you know, we're going to be, you know, a bigger tent party the, like this idea of what the Republican Party could be collapses because Nixon was a criminal. Um, and but what what replaces it is Reagan and this like hmm. religious uh, fundamentalist. 
um, white supremacist sort of view of what the party should fundamentally be. Like that's that that really really takes a hold under Reagan. Like obviously Nixon had engaged in a bunch of white supremacist shit, but like under under Reagan and thanks to kind of the coalition Schlafly builds this like they figure out a way to make it work right. And it becomes like the Republican Party has never stepped away from this shit. Like the Mm -hmm. thing they embrace with Schlafly is the cult of Southern white womanhood. And like, like, you know, this this opposition, this violent opposition to feminism and the idea that like um, there should be any sort of like move for equality between the genders and stuff like they this the the Schlafly's that Schlafly in a nutshell. (laughs) Um, And yeah, it's it's. A real bummer. You know what's not a real bummer, Robert? Oh, uh, the products and services that support this podcast. Yeah. Yay. So the coalition that she creates, it comes along at this time when like Falwell and and Weyrich and these these kind of far right religious conservative crusaders were like trying to grapple with the fact that white supremacy was not as easy a way to like open white supremacy didn't get them mm-hmm. votes as easily anymore. Um, and like they were seeing these civil rights leaders making advances in society and like open racist appeals, losing like their power to convince people and having to like soft pedal their racism. And Phyllis Schlafly provides them a way to like, you don't have to soft pedal your racism. You just have to wrap it differently. Like oh, you can, you can justify the naked imprisonment of, tens of thousands of young black men if you just have a concerned mom get on screen and talk about how scary drugs are like that's that's that can work for you like so that's yeah the GOP has been kind of playing this balancing act ever since Uh, Phyllis Schlafly probably more than any other uh, single person crafted the political strategies and laid the propaganda foundation for the electoral strategy that's brought Republicans to power again and again during our lifetimes she is maybe these the main architect of the right wing's half century of steady political victories she's full of contradictions just to begin with which then just lead into more like even the I mean obviously everyone knows how contradictory the war on drugs is but just at a very basic level on a class level like people say like oh that's a drug neighborhood you to imply it's like a poor neighborhood but every single fucking like rich like Beverly Hills those are all drug neighborhoods like a mansion literally you raid one mansion you can find probably like so much cocaine more than you would find in a whole block in like a you know a lower socioeconomic area, but that's not what people care about because they're rich people. They just yeah, it's well, but all because it's about white supremacy and like yeah, that's what so they're really trying to do. And they yeah, uh-huh. Schlafly, like Schlafly isn't the one who has the idea to do that, but she's the one who figures out how to actually sell it. Like right, they've mm. been wanting to do they 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 had been wanting and attempting and doing that. Like the law had been weaponized and drug policy had been weaponized and stuff before that. And like Phyllis isn't even like a huge part of the anti-drug crusade. She just puts together this coalition and figures out this way of marketing conservatism that lets them do that, that lets Reagan get into office, that lets them justify mm. all of this. This like it, it's it's her. She teaches the Republican Party that the path to their success is to just endlessly create a series of un, unsolvable culture wars. That yeah. that's how you that's how you gain and keep power. Um, hmm. Yeah. By 1985, the ERA was still three states short of ratification, and it 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 dies on the vine. Right? Like it, it's a long fight. Starts in '72, ends in '85. But the ERA is never ratified. It's still not hmm. an amendment. Uh, Phyllis killed it basically and by the mid 1980s she was killing more than amendments uh starting in the late 1970s she'd pushed to make hating gay people a major plank of the republican party she was helping to build her eagle forum newsletter published bigoted cartoons that insulted gay and particularly trans people as the aids crisis began to tear through the gay community schlafly became one of the loudest voices against doing a single goddamn thing to help in 1988 when surgeon general c everett coop who we did an episode about because he was actually a pretty good guy but we were talking about how how shitty the Reagans were on age. But C. C. Everett Coop starts like this age education program to try to get people basic information about safe Mm -hmm. sex to try and reduce how many people are dying of AIDS. And Schlafly calls it the teaching of safe sodomy and like basically goes to war counter messaging against this very basic education Mm. program that the government She's really good at twisting words um, really quickly in a way that like, like sounds bad even to some like 
I am pro education, but like the way that those words hit, you feel the emotion, like you feel a negative connotation immediately. Yep. So adding anti-gay rhetoric to her ERA campaign had allowed Schlafly to unite a number of conservative religious groups behind her banner. Evangelical Mm. and Catholic bigots might not have much in common aside from their hatred of gay people, but Schlafly could use that to bring them together. I'm going to quote from Slate here. Drawing from longstanding opposition to racial integration, interracial marriage, and mixed-race families, her pamphlets and articles transposed racial rhetoric onto fears of homosexuality. She frequently associated the ERA with the dangers of sex mixing, homosexual marriage, and the threat of homosexual school teachers. As early as 1973, she warned that the ERA would legalize homosexual marriages and open the door to the adoption of children by legally married homosexual couples. The ERA would enable these gay rights, she said, because any law that defines a marriage as a union of a man and a woman would have to be amended to replace those words with person. So Schlafly's newsletters, like the uh, phys- the Phyllis Schlafly Report in the Eagle Forum, regularly published cartoons depicting gay and lesbian marriages, images that showed men dressed as women or women dressed as men. Gender anarchy and sexual anarchy went hand in hand for Schlafly. Her 1977 book, The Power of Positive Woman of the Positive Woman, compiled these anti-gay ideas and exclaimed that firemen who constantly risk their lives in our behalf should have the right to make a judgment that their close living and working conditions make a homosexual co-worker intolerable. So so they're not afraid of going into a burning building, but they can't share an office space with a gay person. But they're scared of gay people. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. As the 80s turned to the 90s, increasing went numbers to Harvard, of right wing. I mean, yeah, she sure did. Well, Radcliffe. <laughs> As the 1980s turned to the 90s, increasing numbers of right wing activists began to imitate Schlafly's use of anti-gay bigotry. The campaign against same sex marriage that coalesced in this period and nearly succeeded in making it illegal to be gay and married uh, was based in large part on the work of Phyllis Schlafly. Like she's she's the underpinning ideologically of a lot of this. Like she gets started the propaganda campaign that turns into, you know, the attempts to make the Defense of Marriage Act and stuff. I'm just going to start a counter um, campaign and just make all marriages illegal. And that's just, what I that's think That's what they do. They do. move the things so far. They move the yep. line so far that in order to be against them, you have to be extreme. But if I do that, then it's like, now we're just fighting for marriage. You're not fighting for gay marriage or straight marriage. It's like, marriage is all illegal. Now, if you're a Republican, you just got to fight for gay marriage because marriage falls under that. <laughs> I think we ought to, I think we ought to do away with, with gender entirely and just have, <laughs> you know, people, people who have, people who produce sperm can just generate a bunch of that. We'll throw it in like a wave pool and people who want to have kids go oh, in God. there and that's, that's it. No more, no more. That's the future that liberals want is just a bunch of cum filled <laughs> wave pools and, and no more gender. That's the dream. All wave pools are probably cum filled. Yeah, right? they are all cum filled. Yes, that that is that's what Schlafly was trying to 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 prevent. She knew that our secret goal was just a bunch of semen encrusted water parks, and she was she was fighting to stop <laughs> our secret schemes. So, I don't know. Like she's just a she's just a piece of shit. She's a real bad fucking person. So all of this, you know, she she helps ignite sort of like the anti gay movement of the '90s and early 2000s, and really like obviously homosexuality had been something that people were like murdering folks over in yeah. the United States for a long time before Schlafly. She figures out the language of how to sell that politically, right? Like that's the thing that she does. She doesn't create anti gay bigotry. She figures out how to sell it and keep it as poli- keep it politically relevant in the modern age when you have to be less openly hateful. That's her talent. So when it came to uh, anti-Jewish bigotry, Schlafly and her organizations were a little bit more cunning. They, they, they had to be careful about their opposition to the Jews. Um, the Eagle Forum's newsletters never said the Jews, but they talked constantly about well-financed minorities who were responsible for <laughs> supporting liberal causes and pushing social change. And obviously, who's the well-financed minorities? They're talking about like rich Jewish people. Uh, in their 1975 book about Kissinger, Schlafly and her partner, Admiral Ward, included the line, Henry says some who know him has no god does he have a country so they're asking basically like is henry kissinger loyal to the united states or is he like a a a wandering jew without a country which is like an ancient stereotype right this idea that like the jew jewish people are not members of the societies they live in they're they're members of the tribe and like they're they're always working towards other ends so again they don't schlafly knows that you can't 
print the Jews in a bunch of propaganda, but you can get everybody convinced that there's well-financed minorities, and when you name them, they're always Jewish, who are supporting these social programs you think are evil. And it gets the point across to your followers. How is she, um, like, I just, nobody's pointing holes in the logic that she's saying she's, like, for her country, and she's claiming Kissinger is anti his country, but then she's literally coming for her fellow countrymen. Like, I'm assuming these gay people protected under the equal rights would be citizens. So she's literally doing that. She's coming for her countrymen. Yeah, but the people who like Phyllis Schlafly doesn't think those are her countrymen. You know, that's why... That's but why factually, she, like, they are. On, they always focus about wanting to murder us. <laughs> wanting to murder literally, every... Like, yeah. The definition is that those are her fellow... Con- I mean, th- maybe she doesn't like her country. It sounds like she doesn't like her country. There's about <laughs> half the country that she wanted purged, mm-hmm. right? That's like, that's Schlafly. Mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. most hardcore conservatives these days is is mm-hmm. is like... that, And that's what she helps to build is this, yeah. this right-wing coalition. Where she gets a lot of people on board. Like there's this core, this hard evil core of the of the new yeah. right that's like the John Birch Society people who want everybody they disagree with murdered. And they're able to Schlafly helps them build this shield of folks who are very yeah. culturally conservative, don't necessarily want that, but she's able to weld them into an electoral coalition and then radicalize them to make them more and more hateful. Like that's the process that starts with Schlafly and ends with fucking QAnon. But they just project a lot because it's like they'll say things like, if you don't like it, leave. But it sounds like they don't like it. It sounds like they don't, like they're literally projecting what they they are doing. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't matter. It's just like they, yeah. they, they, they're they they're trying to destroy. A, 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 they're trying to destroy the idea of like progressivism. Like that's all they care about at the core. Yeah. Um, that's what people like Schlafly, these secret these these secret John Birch agents, you know, are 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 all about, and Schlafly's probably the best of them at doing her job. So Phyllis never earned mainstream Republican political acknowledgement in like the way that she wanted. She'd kind of wanted to be involved in defense policy. The Reagan administration never had a place for her. Nobody mm-hmm. ever really did. She never got the job of overseeing the creation of a nuclear arsenal even more gigantic than our current one. Uh, but she got to see Reagan push for the Star Wars missile defense system. And, you know, that had been based a lot on the fears that she helped stoke. And eventually, I think she seems to have accepted that she would be the architect of the Republican Party. Party's future, but she was never going to hold like an office. Uh, she grew into an elder stateswoman of the radical right, never changing, never relenting, and always certain that her hatred of black people, gay people, Jewish people, and every non-Christian, non-conservative would eventually bear electoral fruit. She passed her time by arguing with feminists who hated her for many things, but partly for the fact that she clearly spent her whole life taking advantage of the wonderful things the women's rights movement had fought so hard to earn for every woman. And despite the fact that she was very clearly a liberated career career women and valued the progressive achievements that allowed her to do what she'd done, Schlafly spent every day of her working life fighting to roll those achievements back. In one famous debate, feminist mystique author Betty Friedan told Schlafly, I'd like to burn you at the stake. I consider you a traitor to your sex. I consider you an Aunt Tom. Years later, Schlafly told an interviewer that Friedan had been very ugly to encounter. I reject all her ideology, Um. most of it based on the absurd notion that the home is a comfortable concentration camp and the suburban housewife is oppressed by her husband and society. (gasps) Schlafly (laughs) continued to fight against women's rights and gay rights her whole life. In 1996, she made a deal with Pat Buchanan, whose campaign she co-chaired, to work against, (laughs) yeah, to work together to uh, to write her crusade against legal abortion into the firmament of the Republican Party. Bob Dole, the party's official candidate in that election, wanted to change the GOP's stance on abortion to something more tolerant. Schlafly threatened a a floor fight against his nomination during the convention if Dole even allowed exceptions for rape or incest. And she got her wish. The GOP's abortion plank has never since relented. In 2011, 600 pieces of anti-choice legislation were introduced in legislative bodies across the United States. These are, one way or the other, parts of Phyllis Schlafly's legacy. That year, when questioned about her legacy, Schlafly herself responded, We are winning the abortion fight. Really, all the Republicans who were elected in 2010 are pro-life, including all the women, and we're winning that fight, especially with young people. This was true in the era when that article I found uh, that quoted was written. It cites a 2009 Gallup study that found a 9.8 
increase since the 1990s among respondents 18 to 29 years of age who said that abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. And if I can end this whole terrible story on a semi-positive note, it would be that things aren't continuing in that direction. While the legal assault on reproductive health has only gotten worse over the last nine years, young people are actually more likely to support abortion now than ever, and than they were in 2009 Mm -hmm. when that article was written. I found a really fascinating PRRI study that includes something very inspiring. Quote, Over the past five years, young people are more likely to have changed their opinion on abortion than any other group. 29% reported a change, 10% higher than any other age group. Young adults have changed their opinion to be more supportive, 19%, rather than opposed, 10%, to abortion by a margin of almost two to one. Hmm. So that's good. Well, I think um, a lot of it is like the framing, like they're just so good at framing it. Like when I say I'm uh, like, I'll say I'm pro-choice, but I we shorthand it almost say like I'm for abortion, but I'm not like mm-hmm. for abor- I'm not like, hey, everyone, let's go get an abortion. I think pro-choice is this idea that you should have a choice, but mm-hmm. they've kind of pushed us into the corner where we are screaming about like our abortions. But the point is we want a choice, not that we all want to go and get an abortion. Like it's still like the thing can still be painful, but this idea that you don't have a choice is even worse. Yeah, and I, yeah. It, it it seems like like Schlafly, the way that she framed it, succeeded in reversing the gains of like the reproductive health yeah. movement of the women's rights movement for decades. It does seem like that's I mean, they have more political power than ever, but in terms of how many people agree with the shit she's saying, that seems to be less than there have been in decades. <laughs> like, good. it seems like the wave might be turning back. Like, the propaganda doesn't work anymore, finally. Mm. But she got decades out of that yeah. shit. Yeah. Well, I think stuff like your podcast helped. Like, literally information, I think, is the only thing that yeah. really illuminates um, all these inconsistencies. And I, I mean, I, I don't know. My theory about her is still... She sucks, but I'm just hearing so much unresolved trauma. Like she, her Maybe. broken up childhood know. and this this rug being pulled out from her when her dad lost her job. I feel like she's forever distrusting of power structures, even though she is she becomes the power structure. She's afraid of these conspiracies because she thinks at any moment the thing she puts her faith in will be taken away. Like I think I don't she know. just needs to go to a lot of trauma therapy. <laughs> I I think I don't know if it's trauma or I, like I think that might be less likely in my reading of her life than that. Um, like she saw this. Um, I like I think it was very like like an opportunity. I don't know. She saw an I don't opening. Know. I, 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 but it hurt herself. So then that's why I feel like she didn't have all the information. I I think you were closest to right about her when you said like she wants to be on top. She wants mm-hmm. to be as high as a woman can go, and maybe part like she 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 doesn't she doesn't like the idea of other women doing what she's yeah. doing, and she actively works to stop it. But she wants she herself wants to be liberated. I don't know. Like I don't I I don't have a great handle. I don't know. Yeah, maybe 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 I'm reading it wrong, but I I feel like her, all of her her biographies, everything you find about her is so like written by people who were on the same side of the aisle as her that it is hard yeah. for me to get a real like I I want to know more about how she actually felt as a kid when her dad you know her family's financial situation collapsed and her mom had to take like is that what is like seeing her dad you know depressed and out of work and her mom leaving the house like did that did that really put a lot of anger in her i don't know but i don't think she actually knows i think she wouldn't i don't think she she reads to me as someone who has not actually processed it but of course like you explained earlier like it would have an effect but i don't think she's aware of it and it actually comes out in this bigger way where she feels she needs to control everything around her and be on top and always know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I can say, like, from a personal level, as as the kind of person I am, like, my dad uh, having to, like, move away from the family and stuff when I was a kid um, to, to get work, like, had an impact on me and kind of made, had a, had a big lasting impact on, like, why I hate some of the things I hate, like capitalism, um, <laughs> kind of today. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into her. I think maybe she went, I don't know. I the just don't way. know with Phyllis, but I, I feel like that there's a key to whatever the person she turned into in that aspect of her life. I just don't really understand what it is. Phyllis Schlafly though, died in the Yay. summer of 2016. Oh, oh thank God. Um, she Spoiler. lived way too Maybe fucking yeah. long. She was 92. <laughs> what she died um, of? Did she die in a peaceful way? Like, oh, like- be it, 
probably. Yeah, she died surrounded by her family and bullshit. Um, it's a shame. I wish she'd Happens gotten hit in the face often by an on eagle. This show. Um, <gasps> yeah, uh, before she died, she got to do one last terrible thing. Uh, oh, at no. a St. Louis Trump rally, she endorsed Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States, oh, no. saying, of course she "I did. think he has the courage and the industry, the energy. You know, you have to have energy for that job in order to bring some changes to do what the grassroots want him to do because this is a grassroots uprising." We've been following the losers for so long. Now we've got a guy who's going to lead us to victory. And then her spirit just like she croaked and then her spirit just inhabited his body and became a horcrux. I hate Phyllis uh, and everything that she stands for. I don't know. It's it's a real bummer. She engineered... Donald Trump being able to to gain political power. Uh, and he was very much the guy she was waiting for her whole yeah. life because he's a straight up fascist strongman. And that's what she's always yeah. wanted. And like all of these other Republicans she supported, like wound up short to her in some way. And I, I you know, she knew that Trump mm. would would do the things she wanted, which is violently suppress the people <laughs> she disagreed with politically. Damn. Yeah, that's the life of Phyllis Schlafly, uh, a woman who spent her whole existence crusading uh, against abortion uh, and a woman whose whole life was a monument to the sad truth that like a lot of there's there's some babies out there that maybe oughtn't have stopped being, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm hmm. Yeah, uh, a real a real nasty woman, yeah. as some might, might say. Yeah. I just want to clarify. I don't. I'm not apologizing for her, and I definitely also hate her. But when I when I talk about the uh, childhood stuff, because it's it's more me trying to understand like how do people get so far to this point yeah. where they're an- so almost awful. like working against yeah. their own interests and their own communities. And I truly don't uh, don't mean that in a like a s- apologist way at all. Like I I know like I feel like sometimes I come off centrist, but I don't like her. Let's be clear. <laughs> Yeah, they're just trying to figure out, like, yeah, you're trying to figure out, like, how did this happen? How did she become such a nasty uh, bitch is what we're mm-hmm. all trying to figure out. But there's one positive thing that I kind of hear and, and kind of applies to everything going on now is, like, whenever a side like the extreme radical right tries this hard, like, and throws this much money, because it sounds like they had money their whole life, to oppress or change reality, it means the other side is actually more powerful than they think because they wouldn't be spending all this time and money to oppress, to control if we were actually weak. Like, it's just not, it wouldn't be this hard for them to win and they are having a fucking hard time. So it feels scary, but I think whenever they, we hear about all this power, like it means you're actually powerful. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it means they're scared of what will happen if they don't violently suppress all resistance because they know that, not a lot of people agree with them, right? Like that's the whole, Mm -hmm. like that's why you, that's why you do this culture war shit is because your opponent, like the people who don't like the things you believe are much more numerous than you, but they all believe different things of their own and they're willing to coexist with other people who believe different things. uh, And you are not. And your coalition has been built by all of these people who believe that there's nothing but a series of black and white choices in politics um, and never can be. And if you can get enough people, you know, wrapped around a bunch of issues that are, they see as life and death forever, um, then eventually, like you, 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 you won't lose those people, right? Like you, they, they will always vote for your thing, even if they don't like you or your the people that you're, you're, you know, the candidate you put up because abortion is the big issue, right? Like it's the thing the left is always trying to do this with healthcare, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked. Um, you, and I think it's because in part maybe like no one actually believes that uh, uh, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party is going to do anything about health care anymore. Like Obama had that chance, kind of, um, but we never built anything that really helped people enough. So you don't have this. You have a lot of people who support single payer health care, but you don't have it's not the same kind of electoral coalition as you have with like, we want to make abortion illegal. Um, and hurt gay people and stuff like that's a much more durable coalition because for one thing they know that the Republican Party will continue to do it every time they're in office they will hurt the people I hate whereas 
most of the people who for whom single payer health care is a voting issue don't trust any of the candidates who you know run on variants of it to actually do anything. It's a very frustrating and bad situation, and it's going to kill us all. Or not. That's not really my place to determine. Uh, uh, Teresa, you want to plug your pluggables? Sure. Uh, you can follow my podcast. It's called You Can Tell Me Anything. Uh, if you haven't heard Evan's uh, episode yet, um, you got to go back. It's one of my earlier guests, but you should definitely check that out. And I think I'm going to, I already said this in the last one, but I'm selling hats that say cancel me, daddy. So follow me at Larissa T on Twitter and Instagram for those links. Yay. 